Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com and in here we have the fourth item in the series between me and Steve from Tronics Fix, so the toys before 1980. Now this one in here I had to get permission off Steve because I actually bought this quite a long time ago now and I never got round to even looking at it. I, this is the first time the box has been opened but I haven't actually taken this stuff out to see what's here. Now, there's actually two items in here but only one of them was made before 1980, so that's the one I'm going to be doing. So I've had to kind of guess what the price would be. So it's not ideal, but Steve's happy with it. I'm happy to run with it. This challenge really has not been easy to find a variety of different toys. I don't want every single one to be a clockwork toy. And there's not really that many electronic toys before 1980. Obviously there's some, as you've already seen in this uh, series so far, but there's not, uh, we've only seen one Tin Can Alley, but Steve's done, Steve's done the, uh, the speaking spell, but there's not many to choose from. So let me show you what it is, and then I'll show you what I paid for both of them, and then I'll show you what we've agreed on a price for this particular one here. So basically in here we have, let's uh, open this up, let me get some scissors. Here we go, an Atari 2600, and this is a six switch model. Is it called a six switch? I don't know, there's a, there's a special name for these ones. And this is a woody, because it's got the kind of mock wood panel here. So with this one now, I believe this came out in the Atari 2600, I think it came out in 1977 in the US, and I think 78 in Europe. I don't know the age of this particular one. I know nothing about Ataris. I've never had one. I must have played one when I was young around a friend's house or something, but I don't know. I really don't have a clue about them, how to turn them on, what to do, what they do, etc. Now, I did buy a game off eBay. That's this one here. I definitely remember this game, and I definitely remember I liked it, but it was probably from the arcades rather than playing it around anybody's house. So basically, that's the console itself. I'll show you the eBay listing in a minute. And also in here, which I'm not going to open because it's going to be a different video, is a Spectrum 128K. Now, I had the Spectrum 48K, and when I was growing up, there was always an argument about which was better, the 48K or the Commodore 64. And of course, everybody with a Spectrum 48K would argue that it was the best. But looking back, obviously the Commodore 64 was better, the colours were better and the sound was better. But still, I did love my Spectrum 48K. And the best thing about it for me was that it used to be a lot of fun. I mean, I was really young at the time, but you could easily hack into the more simple games by often just pressing, was it escape top left or break or something? Or even there used to be this joystick, I think. Was it called a Kempston connector? I don't know, but there used to be this adapter you used to plug into the back and then plug the joystick into it. And sometimes by just wiggling the, uh, the, the connection at the back, you used to get into the code of the game. And I used to love it because then you could change things around in the game. For example, when you got to the end of the level and it said like, you know, congratulations, you could change it. And I used to personalize it and put my name Vince and stuff in there. It was just, just a lot of fun mucking about with the colors and stuff. So without even meaning to, you get a little bit into programming. Uh, the other thing which was interesting, I remember I call it hacked, but it's not hacked, all you had to do was press a series of keys, or sometimes you just used to whack the keyboard like this and you used to get into the code. I remember on one game, I can't remember who it was, it actually came up on the screen, Hello Hackers, which I thought was really good. But from memory on the later games, like Akari Warriors and stuff, you couldn't do it. It was just on the very early games, like... Uh, Horace goes skiing and I can't even remember what they're called but it was a long time ago but I, I remember having a lot of fun with that so that's going to be a different video but in here we have what else do we have we've got the remains of a box I don't know whether I'm going to be able to do anything with this you never know I might be able to fix it up a little bit oh actually yeah okay that's both sides of the box there so we might be able to do something with that it's a complete mess at the moment uh whatever we'll give that a go we'll give that a go let's see if we can get it working to begin with and we have a box here that will hopefully have some leads and stuff in so it looks like we've got a joystick and it looks like we've got some uh, adapters and leads as well so i'll empty that in a minute now i'm not sure if the joystick whether the ones for the atari will fit 
don't even know where they plug in. I don't know whether the Spectrum ones will fit in. I mean, they do look like the joysticks from years ago, but I'm not too sure about that. Well, let me show you what I paid for this. So basically, altogether, I paid £50, which is not bad at all. Now, this was from a guy called Danny, and he watches my YouTube videos, and he also sells stuff on, YouTube, uh, on eBay. So when he finds something that he thinks I might be interested in, he lets me know. And then, uh, you know, I, I can look at it and think whether it would make an interesting video or not. So basically, what I've decided with Steve is I paid £50 for both of them. So what I've said to him is if it's okay if I say that the Atari's worth £30 and the Spectrum's worth £20. So basically, if I can s fix this and sell it for more than £30, then hopefully there'll be a bit of profit in there. I didn't know how to divide it up. I'm thinking that the Atari is going to be slightly more expensive than the Spectrum. So that's why I've come up with £30 for the Atari and £20 for the Spectrum. It says here it consists of an Atari 2600 Woody console and a Spectrum. Both have been listed as 40 for the following reasons. Well, let's just concentrate on the Atari. The Atari will not tune in to my new TV, but it was okay with the old CRT one when tested years ago. It might need an AV SCART conversion to work with modern TVs. It comes with power, supply, and connected aerial lead. It comes with box, but sadly the box is quite badly knackered. Because of the listed faults and potential others, no refunds, replacement, or bad feedback will be accepted. Thanks for looking. So there we go. So, I mean, looking at that, it looks like possibly it could be a worker, but it did say years ago, and I'm wondering why it doesn't work for new TV, because even new TVs in the UK also still have, to my knowledge, digital and analog. So obviously this thing's going to be pumping out an analog signal, but TVs, as far as I know, I mean I bought one a couple of years ago, and there's two separate tuning things on it, an, an ATV for analog and a DTV for digital. So let me unpack all the cables here, and then I've got a little TV over here. Let's connect it up and see if we can get any picture. Okay, let's get this all set up. So I've had a look at the bottom of the joystick, and it's a, it's a quick shot one. I'm sure that rings a bell, and it's got A, B, C, D here. And if you have a look, it says, if you look closely, it's hard to see, but A, Atari and Commodore. B, MSX, don't know what that is. C, Amstrad, D, Sega. So obviously it looks like it does various different ones. I'm going to leave it in the A position. Listen to that. Ah, lovely. Sure had one of these for the Spectrum, you know. You used to suck it to the table. When you used to do, I can't remember, was it the uh, the running game, the, the decathlon or something, where or to Daily Thompson? Would that be it, the Daily Thompson game? Where you have to do that to run as fast as possible. Or also the other one was Pac-Land, where you had, just used to have to whack it, but annoyingly you'd have to whack it that way. So you'd be trying to do that as quick as possible to jump over the uh, the uh, the lakes. Right, auto on and off. Okay. Hoping that's the correct power supply. Let's see if there's any stickers on the bottom of this that says what it is. No, it says channel select, but yet there's no switch here. So I don't know whether there's anything missing from this or not. Maybe that might have been a different model. Well, I can't see anything on here that, that, that says uh, what power supply it is. I'm hoping this is going to be the correct power supply. Fits into the back. Let's plug it in. Okay, let's turn it on. So there's no lights or anything to indicate that it is actually on. Let's turn it off again. Let's uh, plug this into the TV and we'll do a tune on the automatic channel. The analog, sorry. An automatic tune on the analog channel. And let's see what comes up. I'm just going to turn it on just in case it is the same frequency as, let's say, something like the Mega Drive. There's nothing happening there, is there? Maybe you have to have a game in to display something. Right, so that goes in that way. Doesn't go that way, fine. 
Right, there's nothing happening there, but I'll leave it all in. Let's tune it up. I'll obviously fast forward through this but you could see there I didn't do a digital tune I just did an analog tune okay well that didn't find anything it came up with zero channels so that's uh, that's no good yeah now that mega drive channel's gone right okay so it's not it's not displaying on the TV. I don't even know if it's turning on, do I? There's no indication anywhere to say whether this is on or off. To my knowledge, I can't see any lights anywhere. Okay, well let's start doing a little bit of fault finding. So let's start simple. Just let's test things like is power getting into here? So let me get my multimeter. Right, so right now we don't know that it's not displaying. Is it not displaying because it's not turned on? Or is it not displaying because there's a problem with, for example, the aerial lead or something else? So first things off, first, I'm just going to turn it off there. I'm going to take out the power cable and I'm going to test it. So let's put this to DC because if we look at the adapter over here, it says input 240 volts, 50 hertz, output 9 volts, 3.6 VA, so I presume that just means amps, so 3.6 amps at 9 volts. So we should, if we put this to DC down here, we should see 9 volts on this one here. Now I'm thinking the middle connector is going to be positive, but I don't actually know. So let's just go here and have a look. Okay, well that says 14 volts. All right. Let me test that again. Let's go the other way around. Minus 14 volts, that's a little bit worrying. Right, okay, slightly worried now. So this is testing 14 volts, yet, if you have a look here, I hope I haven't just blown this. It says here now, output, 9 volts, 3.6. So obviously this thing here, is not working properly, is it? Sure, I'm not wrong there. Right, what I'm going to do is, before I go any further, I'm going to do some research and find out what voltage this actually needs. Because that's definitely 14 volts, and that alone now, maybe I've caused some damage because 14 volts has gone into it. I didn't even think, I didn't even think to check that it might not be pushing out what, uh, what it says it's pushing out. Ah, uh, it's a shame. Problem is, I haven't got, I haven't got one of these to actually do any checking with. Nine volts, unless I could make my own. Hmm. I haven't got a power supply to check anything with. You see. Well, okay. Let me do some research to find out what uh, what this should actually have as the input. I had a look online, and this thing is a hardy thing, so it looks like it can take a variety of different voltages. I did read somewhere that they said that if there's no load, that the Atari power supply can read up to, I think it said, 15 volts. So maybe this is absolutely fine, because remember, I was just testing this purely out in the open here. So, but then a lot of people did say that power supplies do go faulty, because they were always left plugged in, so they're constantly turning the voltage from, for example, 240 volts down to 9 volts or whatever's coming out of here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my mat out, I'm going to take it apart, and then I'm going to see, maybe it becomes obvious when I open it up, maybe the switch is faulty, maybe there's no voltage getting into it, or the voltage is high everywhere. It looks like you can buy replacement ones of these quite cheaply on eBay, so it's not the end of the world, but obviously I would rather use this one if I can. So uh, let's take this thing apart and see what's happening. So what makes it a lot harder for me is that because I, I haven't got one of these, I don't really know what it's supposed to do. For example, 
if I was to plug it in without a game, should something happen on the TV? Do I have to have the game plugged in? What happens if the game's faulty? Would it still display something on the TV? I'm hoping it will, because when you turn it on, you think it should recognise... You think there should be some flicker or some screen on the TV, like just a black screen to show that there is some kind of power there. Good news is there's loads of information online. There's even like this kind of field service manual thing that looks like it goes into a huge amount of detail on uh, every single part of this. So it looks like you can get the information out there. It's just obviously you'd need to spend quite a bit of time learning about it. Slightly worried why there's no switch here to uh, go between channel A and channel B. There's just nothing there at all. Excellent. Right, that's come off nice and uh, nice and easy. Okay. Ah, uh, right. Well, it doesn't seem to be much to it just here, does there? Maybe it's all on the other underside. The cable's definitely plugged in there. It's always interesting seeing something for the first time. I suppose we can take those off. Let's take the board out further. So we've got a ribbon cable doing the input there onto here. Now I wonder when I'll be able to take it all out together. Oh, well that's, that's part of that there. Right, so I should be able to undo that from here, these two screws here. There we go. I suppose we can unplug that. Be gentle with it. Let's unplug this here. Right, so that's nice, because it means you can definitely replace that aerial cable. So let's work just on here now. Well, it doesn't seem to be a huge amount of corrosion and stuff on the board at all. All looks, from first impressions, all looks okay. Oh, look at the power cable there, look. Can you see the... Uh... Let's just focus in a minute. There. Okay. You see in here it seems to be a bit wobbly. Do you know what I mean? Even the, I mean this outer one's going to be some sort of like ground, but even this middle one here, even this middle one here is wobbling a bit. Oh no, maybe not, maybe not, no. Doesn't look great though. Right, let's put power into it and let's take a few measurements around the place and see what we're uh, what we're getting. So this is the on and off switch here. So I want to be concentrating around here to see if power's going through. So it comes from here. It must go through a ribbon cable up here and then work its. Oh, there we go. We can see around the back here power. So we should be able to follow those tracks. It maybe looks like it goes to pin two. Not sure. Right, but we can have a we can have a look there. So the power switch, which is this one here, has six contacts. So if I put power into it, I should be able to measure measure power going in and also power going out. If there's no power coming out, then that could be the problem. So let's plug in the power adapter again. Have this turned off, which is down. Right, so that's in there now, so let's get the multimeter. And let's see where power's getting to. So we've got it on, let's turn it on. So that's on there. Uh, so, where am I going to go to? The outer one there. So I'm just going to go on the 
the outer, you know, this outer bit here, because I know that this one is, let me just double check that actually. The middle one's the positive, isn't it? The central one. Yeah, so 13.8 volts. So if I turn that on there, and I'm just putting the black lead to this bit here. Let's just have a little play around, see what we can get. Thirteen volts there. Thirteen. Thirteen. It's so got thirteen volts everywhere there. So it means that there's definitely power getting through. Thirteen. 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 Okay, that's annoying. Let's turn it off and see what happens. Fourteen. Thirteen. Nothing. Fourteen. Twelve point nine. Okay, so it's just this bottom right hand pin here that goes through when it's turned on then. So we're off at the moment. Hold on a minute. We've still got voltage here now. Oh no we haven't there, nothing. And then when we turn it on, it jumps up. 9.6, let's turn that off again. Nothing on. Right, that says to me the switch is working. Let's gently turn this over. So it was this bottom right hand one here that seemed to be the only pin that was different bottom right. So it's going to be this one here. Okay, so that then goes down here to this thing here. So it goes to this capacitor, I think, here. And then from there, it then goes on to this thing here, which must be some kind of voltage regulator. 104 LM, well I might just show you a bit easier. Right, okay, so... Let's flip this over. Let's go between here again, and let's go down. So that's on the capacitor there, 13 volts. And then it goes on to this pin here, 12 volts. Now what does the middle one do? 12 volts. 12 volts. Then it goes down to here, 13 volts. So it's kind of high voltage everywhere, isn't it? Uh, High voltage everywhere, let's turn that off. Oh, that's on, sorry, hold on. That's off. Wait a minute, I'm getting confused now. Let's go off, and it should be dead here, shouldn't it? But it's not. What's going on? that's in the off position then when you turn it on surely we should get a different reading what on earth is going on I'm sure it gave me a different reading when I was up here Right now it doesn't matter whether it's on or off, I'm still getting the same reading from that switch. So there's like voltage everywhere on it. Slightly worrying. I wonder does that have to be earthed here? Let me just put a couple of screws back in here. Right, well, 
that's a strange one. I'm sure to begin with that when I did that switch, this bottom right one didn't do anything when it was in the off position. And now it doesn't matter whether it's on or off, it's still giving the same reading on both of them. So in theory, then every time you connect it to the TV, it should be just on all the time. It doesn't matter whether this is on or off. This doesn't seem to be making any difference, but still, it'd be different if it wasn't going on, then I would say that's the fault. The problem is it doesn't seem to be going off. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. Hold on a minute. This outer one here, is that... Maybe I'm reading the positive. That should be... This one here should surely be the Earth. One second now. Or the ground. That's weird, there's continuity all over that. Oh wow, well, I feel out of my depth already. I would have thought that we're going to have a positive and a negative on here. So I would have thought that in here then, there should be a distinction between positive and negative. Let me go to... Let me go to voltage. So it's still reading voltage now, so that obviously the capacitors, because I've got nothing plugged in, 6.3 volts, the capacitors are storing the energy there, aren't they? Right, let's plug the adapter back in. Twelve point three. Yeah, okay, so that is the negative. So then the positive goes to here and negative goes to here. Right. Uh, so if that's the negative here. See, look, now it's reading zero volts when I go between here and here. Let's now turn it on. OK, now it's reading 2.8 volts. What is going on? Oh, but when I go on to there... Do you know what? Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm not happy with that connection there because it seems to be loose. If you look, you can see that the solder is missing from here. And it does seem to be very loose. So rather than struggling for ages, it could be something as simple as that. Let's just solder that in properly because that should be in. I can't see why that would should be loose. That should be in properly. And... Uh, I mean, it looks like those two were always going to be joined. Yeah, those two must be always joined. So let me just go to continuity a minute. And let me just go on to the actual pads themselves. That's not going to show me anything because everything is shortened anyway. Well, I'm going to get the solder iron. I'm just going to solder up that there, see if it makes any difference, just in case it is as simple as that. I'll be honest with you, it's uh, it is confusing me, but that's not hard, is it? It's going to confuse me. I've never come across one before, and I don't know how to test it. So, that's no surprise. Well, right, let's solder this little bit up. I'm sure it's not going to make a difference, but if it's on my mind, it's only going to take a, a minute to do, so I might as well get it done.
Right, there we go, that's uh, got a nice big blob of solder on each of them now. Just had a thought, and I can't see any chips or anything, so they must be all hidden in this bit here. Right, so that's nice. That's not that's not wobbling like it was before. I think we should test it on the TV again now because we have done something different there. So rather than getting ahead of ourselves, let's test it now and see what's happening. I'm going to put this other screw in here because then the rest is just basically screwing into plastic. So just in case it is getting some kind of ground continuation through these bits here. Give it another tune. Yes! Did you see it? It came up there. Brilliant! And it says one channel found. What a result. Okay, I don't want to get too hopeful yet, but it looks like it was just the fact that that back bit there wasn't soldered properly. And I suppose that might be a kind of weak spot because maybe it gets knocked at the back or when people are unplugging it and plugging it in. And so I don't know whether it's going to work properly yet or not, but definitely it didn't find something before and now it's found something. There it is. There it is. Right, okay, exit. Now, that looks black and white, so let's pop it up to here. Colour! Look at it. Okay, it seems to be a little bit, a uh, little bit dodgy. That could be the LCD itself. Maybe it needs to be fine-tuned in. Let's plug in a joystick and see what's happening with it. Or maybe, for example, the cartridge might need cleaning. Now, hopefully, I can just plug this in while the game's live. Let's put a bit of volume on this. There is volume. Yes. Yes, yeah, working. I can't blow up there. Am I supposed to shoot them or them? No, maybe not. Well, I'm kind of disappearing and stuff. Yeah, it's hard to, if I'm honest with you, it's very hard to play because, as you can see, when I start going fast, actually it's when I press fire, it's disappearing. I'm not sure if that should be doing that, but the uh, joystick's working as well. It's a shame I've only got the one game. Right, right now it's not going... Not, ah, it's not going down. Could that be the joystick? It's not going down. Well, right, let's uh, reset this game. Game reset. Right, down's not working, but I'd say that's going to be a joystick issue. I'm just going to go on to the different selects at the back. That's because I put it on to C. Okay, so it didn't like that. I just haven't damaged something. Let's turn it off and on again. Right, look, I think what I'll do is, because I mean, I don't really know how well it should be working. I think I will clean everything up. So, let's turn it off take out the cartridge so for example the cartridge itself might be dirty that could be affecting it this thing in here could be faulty so let me take it apart and uh, I'm just going to clean up the contacts and I'm going to spray each of the switches as well with contact cleaner I'm just going to give everything a good clean up and then take it from there because 
I don't know how well it should be working. Should it be perfect? I don't know. Maybe I can try to watch some footage on YouTube. The problem is I need to find footage with the original Atari and not an emulator because an emulator is going to be perfect running on a modern modern uh, you know modern PC. So uh, I'm going to give everything a clean up. I'll just fast forward through all of that and uh, we'll see what will happen after that. Okay, I just want to quickly show you with the multimeter. Do you remember it was given weird readings before? Well, now watch this. I'm going to go on the outer thing again on the back, and now the switch is in the off position. If I go to the bottom right, you can see it's not reading any voltage. Yet when I turn it on, now, you will see it will jump up to 9.6 volts. If I go to the top of the voltage regulator, it's showing 9.7 volts. If I go to the middle, it's nothing. And if I go to the bottom one, it's 4.9 volts so obviously it looks like the Atari is around about 5 volts so now that is working fine and if I turn it off there you'll see the multimeter will go to zero or near enough yeah and then turn it on it will jump back up to 5 volts there we go sorry I wasn't on the thing properly one second right so that's off goes to zero back on 4.9 volts so I'm definitely happy with that so those that connection before must have been it must have been coming and going I'm not quite sure why it, to my testing I was getting 13 volts through everything here I really don't I really don't know maybe maybe it wasn't making the contact and it was sending the positive th actually I haven't got a clue I don't I, I don't know so there's no point in me there's no point in me guessing what it might be So I'm just going to spray in each of these switches here. And the top side. And I'm just going to work each of them quite a few times, hopefully cleaning them up. just little things but look at these switches look how nicely they're made so if you have a look can you see they don't look like something that's going to fail very easy now, maybe they do maybe they do fail but they just look they just look really well made that's what's nice about things from years ago I know nowadays things are more reliable but they were definitely built with longevity in mind be using IPA to do the cleaning so this is 99.9% .9 alcohol dirt coming off that cartridge right, well that looks lovely and clean now nice and bright in there oh there you go 1978 so it looks like I am within the rules of the competition and it says CO12283 revision B. So this must have been maybe the second one along, but uh, 1978. That's good. Really is a very, very nicely made console. Right, so all I'm going to be doing is basically trying to clean the pins in here. So I'm going to see if I can... I'm just going to take this thing apart. I'll show you the board in a minute or two. Let me just see if I can clean this. No, it might be all... Mm, better not mess with that. It looks like it's all soldered into place. I should be able to get something in there though to clean. In fact, let's have a look. All looks perfect. All still looks nice and nice and gold in there. I'm just lifting up this little flap here. But I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a cornflakes packet, you know, a cereal packet, and then just try to put a bit of try to put a little bit of this around it and just put it in there, just wobble it. In fact, what I, sh what I should be able to do is just move put this in and out many times, and that should hopefully. 
this is clean now, that should should kind of clean that, shouldn't it? Not sure. Blow some air in there. Show you this board. Oh, look at that. I wonder is that original or is that an aftermarket thing? The chips just pop in and out. Oh, that is a uh... That would be so easy to replace. I'm not going to yank them out now, but look, they're in little sockets. So in theory, you should be able to just pull. I'm not going to do it, but that looks to me as if you can just pull them straight out. That'd be so nice to be able to change over. Unless maybe somebody's done that. I wonder was it done like that at the factory? Because they all look absolutely immaculate. That doesn't look like it's been done by hand. I mean, I know I'm not very good at soldering, but look, this is what I did. And you can sort of see it doesn't look like the rest, does it? Not sure what that is. It's a red thing. Yeah, very nice. Right, I'm just cutting up a tiny little bit of cereal packet. And I'm just going to try to kind of rub it in here. Right, okay, it does look like it's picked up something. Let's start here. So this is a really clean bit at the end. Let's see if it makes a difference. No, a little bit, not much. Well, I'm going to dip it in here into the uh, IPA, but I just want to be careful because if I make it too soggy, it's going to get stuck in there and that's going to cause me a whole heap of bother because I have to use tweezers to get it out. In case I haven't said that at the beginning of this video, don't copy me because a lot of the times I will be doing stuff wrong. This is just what I do, but it's often not the correct way of doing things. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up all the cover and everything, make it all look nice and then get some wet wipes, get rid of all the dust and grime from everywhere and then I'm going to put it back together and uh, see how it performs then I'll probably go online and actually see what it's supposed to if it's supposed to perform the way that I see it as performing you know with where it kind of disappears and stuff actually while I'm here I'm going to have a quick look at this joystick just in case it's something obvious why it's not going down clicking noise I mean yes it's very dirty but if you have a look when you move it down it moves the spring which then moves a little contact just in here can you see it like flicks down onto it but maybe it's a maybe it's a bad contact the others are all working you never know 
I might be lucky, it might be just a case of if I get some IPA in there and clean it, it might have been a dirty contact, but not so sure. I'm thinking maybe it's to do, it could be, could it be incompatibility rather than the joystick itself not working? Because it does definitely seem to click nice. Right, okay, so if I put the multimeter on continuity and if I go between that contact in the middle there and one of the pads there and go down, you can see it's definitely making the noise. So if Right, okay, I haven't put the joystick back together, but it looks like I've got full movement now, so it must have just been a bad contact. Now, when I press the fire button, the ship is disappearing. But could that be to do with my TV, like the refresh rate or something? So look, if I'm constantly pressing like that, can you see the ship's gone? I'm going to try to crash into somebody when... Uh, well, actually, I won't be able to, will I? Oh, I think you have to rescue those things falling down, don't you, the people? I wonder, can you crash into the modern? Yeah, you can. Uh, right, I'm going to put it back together. I got a feeling it might be something to do with the TV rather than the actual Atari itself. But I haven't at this moment in time got a CRT. Oh, actually, I have got a CRT. I've got my boombox. Maybe I could try it on that. It's black and white. But that would prove it then, wouldn't it? Well, OK. So let me continue on with the clean. I'm going to put this joystick back together. It appears to be working now. And then use a wet wipe on all these bits here. Get them all nice and clean. That's come up really very nice. I haven't used any products. I've just used a wet wipe and a uh, bit of kitchen towel on it. So maybe you could get it shinier by using some sort of plastic cleaner, but I'm not going to. I think it looks nice as it is. The wood's come up really good. So now it's just going to be a case of putting it all back together. if there would have been a switch there originally I mean there's definitely a place for it and there's definitely a hole under here that says channel select A and B but there's nothing there so maybe if this was a second revision maybe on the first one there was something there or maybe it's been removed throughout the years for whatever reason okay there we have it now look how nice that has come up Clean the leads, water casing, everything. I think I would definitely describe that as good condition. But then again, everybody's got their own opinion. But that looks nice to me. And the game goes in nice. Right, let's connect up to this TV one more time and then we'll try to connect it up to a CRT. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that because the CRTs I have are so old that they don't actually take an aerial input. They've got their own aerial but I'll have to sort of uh, jerry-rig something up. Just notice I haven't put it together right there, it's bulging out. There you go, that's better now. Black and white, colour, game select. Yeah, joysticks working.
Right, I just want to see what happens now if we turn it on without a game in. Okay, so you get a black screen, so that's useful to know. So, in theory, you should still be able to tune it in. Yeah, when I do it, you can sort of see pixels come up on the screen. Yeah, okay. So the only thing left for me to do is to try to sort out this box somehow and connect it up to a CRT, see if it's still blinking when I uh, press the fire button. I just want to see if Joystick 2 is working. I've got a feeling that this is only going to be for two player. I just want to see if I can control it when it's in two. No, so you can't. Yeah, so I can't. So I won't be able to test that port, unfortunately, because I haven't got an Atari joystick. Okay, so the auto fire works as well on the joystick. Right, let me get that other TV set up. Okay, I've got my little Radio Shack boombox there with a built-in black and white CRT TV. Now, it does take a 3.5 input, so what I've done is, ideally you would just need a female to female, but I haven't got that. But what I do have is I've got a female to RCA male and I've got a female to RCA female so that's coax obviously so if I pop that in there and pop that into there and that into there then in theory that should all work so let's put it into the external I think at the back here the external aerial or antenna there we go right Let's uh, put it to TV. Now I have to turn this on and I have to tune it in. So let's spin this. Here we go. Yay! Right, there we are. No, it's still disappearing, isn't it? Let me zoom that in a bit. It's going to be hard to see it because obviously it's going to be, you're going to see black banding and stuff. Yeah, every time I press fire, the shit disappears. Surely it shouldn't be like that. I wonder if that's the game or whether that's the Atari. I don't know. Right, I'm going to have to go to Google for this one, see if there's anybody reporting problems like this. I wish I had another game to test and then it would sort of give me an idea, because this is quite a fast moving game. But look, if I was to put it on auto fire, there you, look, you can't see the ship at all. Yeah? Right, okay. Now I don't know if that's the fault. I don't know, sorry, I don't know if that is a fault or whether it's just how it is. I'm not sure. Let me Google it and find out. Right, so thank God for the internet. That's all I can say. So rather than taking this apart, all I typed in was uh, Atari 2600 flickering uh, Defender. That's what I typed in. And it just says here. Most flicker in Atari 2600 games. So somebody asked the question, which games do you think flicker the most? And then various people give their opinions, and then they're all on about Pac-Man mostly. But then if you go down here, it says... Hold on. There you go. Don't forget about Flick Offender, uh, Defender. And then it says... Uh, yeah, Defender and Pac-Man take the cake. I find sometimes the flicker causes your shots to pass right through the enemies. And then it says, heck, the flicker causes you to pass right through the enemies, which is exactly what I found there. 
and uh, yeah, there's more about it down here. Defender, because the flicker when you fire actually makes your ship invisible to the game. There you go, so that's exactly what I found. And then somebody put, I always thought that was a cool feature. I seem to recall it being explained away like that in an instruction manual or in an article in an Atari Age magazine or something. I can't find that now, but I did find this, this little gem, and it's on about a uh, thingy. There we go. Even though I enjoy 2600 Defender for what it is, it also happens to be a flickering nightmare. So basically, uh, yeah, it says here, in Defender, your exhaust flickers madly at times. Your ship drops out of existence every time you shoot. So I'm 100% happy now that it is a problem with Defender and the Atari 2600 in general, and not my one there. I don't remember that happening in the arcade, but maybe when you're a child you're a lot more forgiving about things, or maybe the arcade worked perfectly because that was designed just for that particular game, I presume, anyway. While this has to do a load of different games depending on whatever you plug into it. Depending on whatever you plug in. So all I have to do now is I'm not going to touch this anymore because I'm happy that it's working. I can't test the port 2 at the back. I presume it's going to be working. I can't test any other games, but to my knowledge, this appears to be working fine. So now I've got to tackle this box here and see if I can make it any bit better at all. Uh, do you know what? I'm not even going to film it because you're not going to learn anything from it. All I'm going to do is try to peel some of the sellotape off gently. And if it looks like it's going to start taking the actual ink off, see that bit there looks to be okay. If it looks like it's taking the ink off, then all I'm going to do is basically stick it back down and cut off the excess just to try to neaten it up a little bit. So I'll be back to this shortly. So I'm just working on the box, which is a bit of a lost cause. But a viewer told me about this tape here is basically gum tape and I got it off Amazon it's quite cheap it looks kind of like cardboardy and then you just have to wet it it's sticky on one side but it does appear to be good and basically rather than putting sellotape on the outside you can just use this on the inside and it does seem to form quite a strong uh, quite a strong kind of bond so basically I'm going to put it right the way across here now let me just trim that down a little bit more here and I think you're supposed to apply it with a sponge. Now, I haven't tried it with a sponge yet, but what I'm doing is I'm just dunking it just for about uh, a second. So in, out, and then get rid of the excess. And I can feel now that this is the side with the gum on. So I'm just gonna put it on here like so. And then force it down. And it appears to give quite a nice connection when it's uh, when it's dry. So I'll let that dry up now. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to put another bit just across here now because this box is broken down the middle here. So I'm going to put another strip just underneath that. So you can see now when it starts to dry, it does actually form quite a good seal. This one's still damp here. But when that dries. I'm really pleased that I was told about that because I think when it comes to fixing up old boxes, I mean this one here is never going to look any bit good at all. But let's say on the first one that I did with those cars and the corners of the boxes were just broken but yet it still had form, it was still nice and strong. This would have been perfect just in the corners instead of using sellotape which is just going to just uh, lose its stick after a few years and then cause problems again. I think this is a good fix. I'm glad I was told about this one. So here we have it up on the big screen and you can see the woody down there on the floor. Now the box is really bad but it's come out okay considering it was just a big flat mushy lot of cardboard before. So I've given it a little bit of shape back but it's still very very floppy. But it's still nice just to be able to read what was on there originally. And uh, this side here is just completely missing. You can see all the flaps are missing. But still you can still read up about it. And also it says there UK has also got a serial number. And the box itself does look kind of nice. If that was up on the shelf, you could see why people would be drawn to it. Now, as far as the actual console itself is concerned, I think it's come out absolutely brilliant. So I didn't have to add any special products to it, just a little bit of elbow grease, so basically just a wet wipe, and then a dry bit of tissue, and it's come up absolutely perfect. And it was nice that it was faulty. There was actually a fault with it, just had to solder 
that power connector at the back. So really happy with how it's turned out, and as well as that, remember the joystick. The joystick wasn't working properly either, but when it comes to selling this, I won't be including the joystick, and also, as far as this competition is concerned, this would be after 1980 anyway. So I'm going to be keeping the joystick for the Spectrum, and I'm just going to be selling the console itself. I might include the game. I have to work out what I paid for the game to see whether it would be worthwhile including it. If I only paid £3, then I might get my money back by having the game with it. If I pay £10 for the game, I don't think it's worth it, because if I sell this for £4, £40. I don't think somebody's going to pay £10 extra for one game, so I have to uh, I have to look into that. But it works, I think, as well as it should work. Now, to me, it's a little bit of a letdown, the fact that every time you fire, your ship up there disappears. But at least I know now it's got nothing to do with the actual console itself, my one. It is just obviously a fault with Atari's. Uh, so, yeah, I I'm glad that I didn't spend any more time on that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's very fast moving. It's just that the flicker itself, to me, is, uh, is a letdown. I think you get just as much enjoyment, personally, as something like this, a little handheld Atari. It's got a nice screen on it, quite a few games built in. People slate this. When you read the reviews, a lot of people slate it. I'm wondering, is it really that bad? Or do people look back at games like this with rose-tinted spectacles on, thinking everything was better years ago? If they played it now, in 2019, would they be disappointed, just like I am with it? So, I am quite happy with this, and I'm just wondering, is it just like a thing now where people just slate everything that's new because they think things in the past were much better? Really, this would have always been bad. It's just that if you didn't know any better, then you're going to put up with it, because obviously if you're used to playing something in the arcade and then you have the chance to play it at home, you're going to be really happy. Uh, yeah, that's sort of my views on that anyway, but... I, I still think you could have quite a bit of fun with this game. Maybe if you get over the fact that you keep going invisible. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, that's it for this video. I'm now going to show you what I sold this one for. I think I, if I pay £30 for it, then realistically I'm going to have to sell it for over 40 to make any profit on it. And I don't actually know the going rate off them, so I'll have to have a look what other people are selling them for and then price mine accordingly. So you will find out now what I sold this for. So the item has sold, and it has sold for £37.99 plus £8.99 postage. So that is, what's that, 38 So that's £47, or £46.98p. So I took plenty of pictures, and I believe I was completely honest with the list, and I said about, I think that the switch is missing, and this, that, and the other. And uh, But I did say it was very clean. I said the box was absolutely awful, you see, working well. But box is terrible. So I'm hoping the, the new buyer will be happy with it. I think I would be happy to keep it. I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit disappointed that this was part of the competition. Because I haven't got a Woody. I haven't got an Atari 2600 in any shape, size or description. So I think I could possibly get another one of these in the future. Now, I didn't include the game. And the reason I didn't include the game is because... The game cost me £5, and after fixing this up, I looked at the price of them on eBay, and they don't go for much money, and I thought, realistically, whether it's with or without the game, I don't think I would have made an extra £5 because of the game. So I thought I'd keep it for myself, and then if I get one, at least I've got a game to play on it. So the reason I'm happy with that price, it's not a great price, but the reason I'm happy is because a few hours before this auction was ending, it was only down as £21, it only had two bids on it. So I was worried that I was going to lose money, but... I had this down as £30, and you think, oh, well, you know, definitely made money there. No, not necessarily because of eBay and PayPal fees. I haven't worked them out yet, but they're going to be somewhere in the region of, I would presume, about £8, £9, £10, pound, that sort of price. Postage, I don't know how much it's going to cost. I'm thinking it's going to be £6 or £7 pound postage. So when you add all that up, you're probably looking at about £44 pound anyway. I mean, I would obviously do all the proper sums. And if I'm selling it for £47, well, you can see that there's very little money to be made. But I'm pretty confident that this is going to be a percentage increase and not a decrease, which is the main thing. Because me and Steve from Tronics Fix are finding it particularly hard so far to make money in this competition. I haven't watched his part four video yet, but certainly in parts one, two and three the tendency is that you tend to lose money. I mean, I had one fantastic item, the Tin Can Alley, but apart from that, everything else really is selling for either uh, what you bought it for, including fees, or less than what you buy it for. So I think 
trying to flip things on eBay, the old stuff, unless you're going for something really niche and specialised, I really don't think it's an option to... Uh, I don't really think it's an option to make money, which is a shame. But the problem with eBay is there's too much other people involved. There's too many fees involved. Everybody's got their finger in a pie, and there's not enough pie left for the person doing the work at the end of the day because everybody else has already taken all the money out of it. But still, it's a fun competition. I'm really enjoying this one, and I hope... You guys are enjoying watching it too. So please subscribe for part five if you haven't already. Also look up Tronix Fix and subscribe to him if you haven't already. And give it a thumbs up if you liked it. And hopefully my last one, part five, will turn a nice profit. That would be a nice way to end this particular series. So that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Take care. Bye now.